Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at the streets of LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. Again, we want to thank you for joining us on this uh, Latter Gay Stories episode and for giving us an hour of your time to better understand the LGBTQ experience. For those of you who are listening on an audio version of this podcast, we invite you to subscribe to this channel. And also, if you do us a favor, leave us a rating. By leaving us a rating, it helps to uh, spread the reach of our Latter Gay Stories podcast, and we would love that. We'd uh, love to show up in more people's uh, algorithms as they search for uh, podcast episodes related to uh, Mormonism and the topics uh, surrounding the LGBTQ community. So if you do that, it would be wildly appreciative. You could also leave us a review as well, but only if you give us a five-star review. That's the caveat. That must happen. <laughs> But thank you for those who are uh, following us on uh, the video versions as well. If you are watching on a video version through YouTube, uh, Facebook, or one of our other platforms, we invite you to join the live chat and participate in this conversation, but also share it. By sharing episodes like this, you help us to build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community by inviting others to better understand the lived experiences of the LGBT community through story. And that's exactly why we're here. So again, like, subscribe, share. We'd love for you to do that. We've got a fantastic episode for you today. I'm super excited about it. It's one episode that I have um, wanted to do for quite a while. Years ago, uh, probably 2018, but her story stretches even earlier than that. Around 2018, I came uh, in contact with some paintings, some portraits that were done by uh, Melinda Hanna. And she is an artist, uh, also a Latter-day Saint, an active Latter-day Saint who lives in the Pacific Northwest. And she, and we'll talk about this a, a little bit later in the story, was inspired by the November 2015 policy to start sharing the stories of the LGBTQ community. And she did that through her talent, through portrait painting. And we'll um, discuss kind of the impetus, discuss the genesis behind uh, those portraits. We'll discuss what motivated her to highlight the LGBTQ community. We wanna talk a little bit about her own individual experience. We want to talk about uh, what has changed or what has um, become better in this space as a result of her advocacy and allyship to the LGBTQ community. And then really what um, can all of us do to better understand this beautiful community? So with that, I want to welcome to the podcast, Melinda Hanna. What did I miss in the introduction? It sounds fabulous, complete. Perfect. Should we just end the podcast here? Is, is that what you're saying? Is it over? <laughs> what a relief. <laughs> well, thank you, Melinda. Thank you for uh, coming all the way from the Pacific Northwest, from Washington, uh, to the Latter Gay Stories studio to share your story. I'm so glad to. And not only that, just I, I hope that the community at large gets to better understand the work that you're doing in this space. Um, and also just maybe personally, I hope that they support it as well and help you and give you the resources necessary to continue sharing your talents and, and inspiring the, the community to, to see, literally see the LGBTQ community. There are still people waiting to get a portrait, so that would be great. So before we jump into the portraits and talk about all the paintings, um, tell us a little bit about who Melinda is. Well, who I am is really kind of my journey. So um, I don't know if you want the, it all started way back when I was born or for, <laughs> we'll skip to age 13. Um, I grew up in the Mormon church and I um, always had problems fitting in. I, I was definitely estranged and brutalized at church and, and also at school and in my family and uh, felt like I was completely alone. Um, so I was acquainted with sorrow, for sure. And, but I always kept a relationship with the Lord to the best of my ability. And, um, and then I remember, um, you know, I went to Brigham. Well, I had a great experience in high school at Cottonwood, mostly because of some really Christ-like students that I 
was connected with. But BYU was a whole nother matter, and I really wasn't say, socially ready to deal with that. It was like this set of Charlie's Angels where all the girls were supposed to look like one of the angels, and there were three girls to every guy, and it was a super um, socially intense environment, which I was not at all prepared to handle, so I ended up flunking out and um, and ended up in a, a mental hospital and then eventually packed my stuff in the middle of the night um, and drove to Seattle to become a truck driver, and, I, and that was 40 years ago. Yeah, so what you're talking about is kind of Mormonism's toxic perfectionism. This idea the culture, that yeah. you have to look, act, and be something that mimics perfection. Yeah, and, and some people just can't, and I couldn't, and I sure relate to everybody I've painted who, who also has been completely bereft by, um, by wanting so badly um, to be something that they're not. You know, it's just, it's tragic well, understatement. I, yeah. How do we get there? How, how did we get there as Latter-day Saints to this to this well, point where? I think we got there because um, we're righteous and entitled with an attitude. <laughs> 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 I mean, most people are not pretty deep. And, um, and there is a real safety in belonging in the shell of a structured environment like any kind of um, organized religion it's a very it can be a very very safe place to be it doesn't take a lot of deep soul searching or thought however in my opinion and um, what I learned in college years later was about secular humanists who did not belong to a fold or an organization and I saw that that I met some really wonderful people who don't believe in God, but I began to see their journey as a lot more courageous because they looked at the world and said, I am accountable for what I create here. I am responsible. Um, it's not the fault of, of the group, and the group is not protecting me, and I am walking in courage and honesty. So. I mean, there's good sides, there's good things about both. But to answer your question, um, I think, I, I also think a lot of people want life to be as easy as it can possibly be. Um, and that means going along with the club and, you know, and if you fit in, that's really, really wonderful. But then if you don't, then you've got to, you know, oftentimes have soul searching. So I think it's ignorance, I, and that's why I use the term often of well-meaning Christians that absolutely have no idea of how, why someone would um, commit suicide after hanging with them. And, and let me just say quite candidly, and I've said this at church too, that for years and decades, I would continually come back to the church, and one day I had a talk with God, and I said, um, I believe this gospel is advanced and enlightened. However, I hate myself when I'm around these people, and I cannot, I, I cannot find my way out of the self-hate. Um, and so I, and I said, Lord, I'm going to leave. I do not know what else to do. Um, what was really wonderful, and so there I was for 20 years, finding different ways to get spiritual strength. And believe me, it's out there and there's many wonderful experiences available. If you want to ask me at some point, um, this project got me going back to church just to get to know certain people. And I found that I wanted more. I also had been through 20 years of therapy at that time and every kind of um, self-improvement program uh, social improvement program you could possibly imagine. And so I wanted more and more. And one day I, I sat, was outside the building, the church building, and I said, I wonder what would happen if I went in with an open mind and opened eyes and let's just see what happens. And that was the beginning of having a satisfying experience, but also in a congregation 
where I feel like I can be my weird, powerful, in your mofo face self, and I am accepted. But I know that's not the experience that a lot of people have. So I hope I answered that question. <laughs> that was a that was a great way of doing it. Um, yeah. So to better understand and just get a grasp on the chronology. Yeah. You had attended BYU. Um, uh, then, uh, because of those situations, left BYU. Yeah. And and then went inactive for two decades. Mostly, yes. There were times when I tried to go back and it was always the same horrifying experience and I, I have to say I came to Utah from a broken family and from a violent family where my father had grown up in the barrio in LA and um, and so there back then at high school there really wasn't a like your parents are divorced and um, again it was I couldn't fit in with these people and I just felt like I didn't have any resources. But that, and just really quickly, since one of my majors was classical voice performance, I remember singing before the faculty and I got all these really nasty notes that said, you know, if you're going to be a singer, you really need to connect your voice with your body. Well, I wasn't connecting my voice with my body because most of the time I wasn't in my body. I was living in a fantasy world or I was in post-traumatic stress where, where um, there, you know, I wasn't in the here and the now. So I just wanted to say that was part of it too. Were they alluding to um, body size? Oh yeah, I had a terrible time with that because no matter what I did, I couldn't be, you know, as slender as Farrah Fawcett. And, you know, and people say, well, that shouldn't matter, but for a lot of the for a lot of people, it really, really does. So it totally ruined my life that I had a big butt. Okay. <laughs> I mean, in so many ways. Wait a minute. Isn't Sir Mix a lot from Washington? <laughs> Wasn't that where I liked it? Um, his anaconda well, song? All I can do is forever thank Kim Kardashian <laughs> um, and the bulbous Kardashian sisters. However, they were nowhere to be seen in the, in the 1970s. That makes sense. But it also goes back to our early discussion about toxic perfection, perfectionism. Yes. That is, yes. that is really something that is an undercurrent within Mormonism. This idea that, um, you have to look and act a certain way in order to, there, it, it's as if the culture wants you to believe that this, the ability to hold on to the straight and narrow or the, the iron rod requires you to look and act, um, a certain and, way and feel a certain way, like cheerful. Like, you know, like, why are you so morose? You know, why are you acting all depressed? You know, if you let Christ into your life, then you would be like cheerful. You know, I also noticed a lot of at BYU um, women who sounded like young girls, you know, it was very much a part of the whole thing. I and sure I, appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, you are so, you are so welcome. <laughs> I get it's it. the culture it's it's it. you know it's the culture and it, it at zion's own university over at byu um sure there's probably the gospel there too but there's a lot of culture sure there is that culture led to a lot of monumental problems within mormonism especially within this discussion this this topic of lgbtq mormonism um, yes. Let's talk a little bit about 2015. Yes. Because that seemed to be the apex of your transition. Yes. Where, where you really, as a, as a Latter-day Saint, decided to take a hard look at Mormonism and its treatment of its LGBTQ members. I would love to share that story. Um, I had chronic fatigue back in the 1990s, and the, about the only thing I could do was walk a block or so almost daily to the Capitol Hill Alano Club, which was the AA club for gay men. And the men welcomed me with open arms to be a part of the meetings, and I was glad to feel the comfort of, of that community. But it was also a time when gay people were, um, their population was being decimated by AIDS. So, I found myself in a room, and by the way, I want to put in a plug for 12 Steps because 12 Steps is where I found spiritual strength and learning, and I didn't have to compete with a religion to do it. 
But anyway, getting back to being with the men, um, every few days someone would be gone from the table because they had passed away due to AIDS. And when you're in a room with people who don't know how many days they have left, things get very real and authentic. And I have to say, I learned so much because I had grown up in the 70s and if you were gay, you did not talk about it. I couldn't imagine anything more gross than that. I heard, had heard that Elton John might be gay, okay? But I wasn't sure, you know, until many decades later. So here are these men talking about, the only reason they're talking so candidly about their experience is because that is who they were. There was no time to waste. And I, I, I learned so much. Um, and probably the main thing is that I felt, I believe in Christ and I felt the presence of Christ in that room like it was tangible. It blew my mind and I thought, what an incredible time to be alive and witness this. And then it it also matched up with what I knew in the Bible, that Christ went and spent time with people that nobody else wanted to spend time with. And I felt his love for them, and the thought occurred to me, these are his chosen people, because especially back then, most of them knew family and friends did not understand. They had this whole truth that was invisible to many people that they loved. Now, a lot has changed in the United States, and there are many families that have embraced the issue of people who are not going to be fitting into a certain mold. And I think a lot of, as I've heard a lot of parents say, they would much rather love their child alive than be right about something and visit them at the cemetery. But again, getting back to the thought occurred to me, these are, these are the misunderstood chosen children and they're only gay because they really truly are and that it wasn't so much a gay person doesn't necessarily go out to clubs every night and party, party, party. I mean, it has nothing to do with that. There are gay people who choose to live celibate. Um, it was their truth. And all I can say is it forever changed. I, I just thought, I don't know how all this fits together with the truth that I learned growing up, but I know there's something here and, and how lucky and, and blessed for me that I got to, that they welcomed me and that I got to be part of it. So again, and, and then throughout the years, I try and go back to church and I'd have that same self-hate experience. And I just like, you know, Lord, I just don't know how to get along with these people. You know, I'm out of here. Um, but when the, the 2000 policy was leaked on the internet and I heard that there were 33 suicides in the first 88 days and I could suddenly imagine how young adults who have issues of LGBTQIA or whatever, there's no, there was no infrastructure for them to deal with what, the, it's hard enough being a young person and having hormones. If you have no support and no in, in infrastructure for support, like what can you do? And I just, I felt this screaming inside my head and I thought, and then when I read the policy and this is a hard, okay, this is where it gets a little difficult because first of all, when I read part of the policy, I just thought, these words did not come from the Christ that I met in those rooms. It, it, it's just, if Christ said, you've been driving down I-80 and I want you to switch to 215, <laughs> Christ could certainly be firm, but the whole message would be delivered with this unbelievable foundation of love. And that wasn't the language that was used. Let's, and, let's back up for just a second okay. for those who um, aren't familiar with the policy that we're talking about. Yeah. In, in November of 2015, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints created a policy that's been um, disaffectionately <laughs> known as the policy of exclusion. And in that policy, um, it barred uh, and 
prevented a number of things from happening. The first was that it no longer allowed children of same-sex parents um, or same-sex parent in its original version to be baptized in the church, to receive uh, rights and privileges, uh, naming blessings uh, within Mormonism because they, they were children of a gay parent. It also precluded them um, from advancing and serving a mission without uh, first presidency or uh, essentially the prophet and uh, his counselors written uh, expressed approval. And further, it then deemed their parent or parents as apostates, which meant immediate excommunication, that they were to be removed from the fold of the church. It was called the policy of exclusion because it very much excluded gay Mormons from their congregations, but most importantly, from their families. And it triggered it, what Greg Prince, a historian for the um, a historian for church-related topics, he wasn't a church historian, but he's an author and a historian. Uh, Greg Prince said it was one of the largest mass res resignations in the history of the church, with some stakes um, losing up to 10% of their population in resignation immediately. And, and Hannah, you talked a little bit about the number of suicides that happened. It was reported uh, around 30-plus uh, suicides happened as a direct result of this policy that it injured the community that much. It was monumental. It was. And so I, up until then, my secret thoughts about the Mormon uh, faith was that, well, the leaders are inspired from God. But when I saw the language, I thought that did not come from Christ. And then I, now this is a little bit hard for me because I do go to church now. And also in a place like Seattle, the population of Mormons is very small, and so Mormons don't tend to be arrogant in Seattle. And so I feel bad when I say something like this about the church because there's a lot of people that are living a very difficult faith in Seattle and are judged on every turn, and I don't want to hurt them or make it harder for them because some really incredible people go to church. But reading that language, the, the next thing that happened after I thought just a, like a shock throughout my body, this was, this is not the language of Christ, was now it all, now I understand it all. This is, there are well-meaning Christians who are indifferent to the journey of other people. That don't fit in, and and it's an instraint. It's a way of his estranging, um, and that that drives a lot of people to self harm, as it had driven me to self harm for for very very similar reasons. People who think that they are so got it all together, the cool indifference is quite noticeable when you want to belong to that faith. And it, and again, it is a fact that when people don't feel like they can be accepted, unless they know other tools, they, it can turn into self-harm or, or suicide. I just think, I'm just thinking back to what you talked about, sitting in a room with all of these wonderful people who were impacted by the AIDS epidemic. And that was the place that you saw Christ. That was the place where you found Christ-like love, not in a pew, not oh. under the roof of a chapel. Oh, now I got to say something else. During that time, I was sometimes going to church, and I just remember the fire I felt in the group with the men. And then I would go over to the Bellevue State Center, and it was as cold as ice. I mean, the vibe in the whole building was as cold as ice. So, yeah, just like you just said. And, but then I also thought, I mean, all of a sudden my life began to make so much more sense to me. And I also, because whether I'm the greatest artist in the world or not, the gift that I have is the ability to see the innate beauty and dignity within any person. And if I can show that in a portrait, what I want 
is for people to see a soul and not a label. And I thought, this is how I can help. When, so that was the genesis of the art project. Yes. When did you finally put paintbrush to canvas? It wasn't that long afterwards. Um, uh, I don't know if we're allowed to mention names, but Aaron C. Brown, who... Uh, there were so many people that left the church. I think he was in the stake presidency. And um, I, I was led by people I knew to talk to him. And um, he got me in touch with Mitch Main and Geraldine Poole and a few other people. And then they started, and then I sent them a small video of my art um, with the message. And then they sent me a, na a list of names with um, families, couples, individuals throughout the United States that were showing that you could live through being gay and being Mormon, or that were moving, that had some positive as that had a background with the church and were having positive lives. And so that it started very, very soon after that. Before we show um, mm -hmm. the art, <laughs> I want to I want to touch this topic. In fact, I want to like manhandle it because we don't talk enough about the point you just brought up, and that is that successful, happy, thriving gay Mormons exist in this world. Yes, they do. And if they can, uh, there are many of them that I know that you also know. And if they can find, I just want to say really quickly, I don't, most people can, in this age of casual commitments, a lot of people say, well, why don't you just leave that darn church? Well, for most people, if they really believed it in the traditional sense, they can't just walk away and drop it from every cell in their body. I mean, it, it, everyone I personally know has gone through the dark night of the soul. Um, that many of those people now have joy and healthy relationships. That's another thing. It's not gay families that are ruining families in America. It's, it's husbands addicted to porn that are straight. That's what's wrong. Sorry, I don't mean to go off on a tangent, but there's some very um, uh, high integrity, loyal people who also identify as gay and not and do not belong to a religion. I mean, there's some of the finest people that you could possibly meet. And I'm sorry if I got off topic with that. But I have I am so happy for every person I know who has found joy and and freedom and permission. And I think that's that's important to bring up because when we discuss Mormonism and this topic in particular, I think one thing that the church has done um, so effectively is that it's helped its congregants uh, come to believe that there is no happiness, no spiritual experience, and no joy on the other side of the aisle. That without Mormonism, there is nothing that can be obtained that is wholesome and and of praiseworthy and of good report and of all the things that the fruits of the Spirit talk about in Galatians. And I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong because, and, and we'll discuss that through your mm -hmm. art project, and yeah. we'll discuss that through many episodes here on this podcast, through the lived experiences of the LGBTQ community, that as effective as the church is at, at teaching people that there is no happiness on the other side of the aisle, your stories, the queer stories, are invalidating that belief, that there are indeed happy, successful, joyful, spiritually led beautiful people out there who also are gay. And I think that is incredible. And some of them go to church and some of them don't. Amen to that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what I think, that's where I think Mormonism misses the mark. And, and sometimes, um, and it just goes back to your experience with the, the men, um, in, in those, those circles that ended up not being there the week after and their families that were impacted by that how many of them were ostracized from their own families because of religion because Especially of these back beliefs then, yeah that's where i think not only just mormonism but christianity misses the mark it certainly has i mean there's there are things really changing on a fundamental level in our country for the better yeah 
and it needs to continue to change until everyone feels that they have a, a place of safety and and community. Well, and, and I mean, you bring that up and M. Russell Ballard, Elder Ballard said that very same thing. We need to do a better job at listening to and understanding the experiences of the LGBTQ community. And they, yes. that community needs to know that there's a place for them in the church. My invitation back to Mormonism is where's that place? Because they continue to ostracize LGBTQ Latter-day Saints at an unprecedented rate. Um, and we need to do better. I agree with Elder Ballard. The church needs to do better because, as he said, surely we haven't done um, good in the past. So you put, that was a wild tangent. Look at your, your we both Renaissance. did yeah. just now. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So you finally put um, paint to canvas. Yeah. And you've accumulated a few of these stories uh, through networking. How do you start? And, and what does this project look like? Um, well, it look it looked different to me than it looked to the community at large. Um, I mean, even in affirmation, there's a there's, you know, people can be mean to other people, and that, um, and there was certainly some of that that kind of made me want to crawl into a shell. But but the love I felt for the people I painted and the people I got to know, and the whole idea of watching them heal their hearts become whole um i mean what an incredible opportunity and and i um i mentioned in my personal life that i've moved four times in the last seven years because that's what it means to be an artist right now in society and so i had kind of stepped away from the project but there are still people that want to be painted and that are waiting to be painted. Let's talk about your first painting. Okay, great. Because sometimes we have, as artists, there was this idea. And then what was the thought process? What got you to the point where you said, okay. this is the first story I want to highlight? This, yeah. Here's the person. Well, there's so many. But the first one I did on my own was um, I had a friend named Doug. And I had met him in a singles ward back in the 1980s. And he was well-dressed and handsome, but, you know, his engagements never seemed to work out. And he was... <laughs> <laughs> he had a very unique style in a number of ways, including spiritually. Um, but he liked me because I was quirky. And my path crossed with his path many times over 30 years. And what happened for him... Um, was he at one point discovered that he was gay. Um, he got involved with some really bizarre spiritual groups that, that cling to the dark side, basically. And he would totally act out, and then he would totally come clean and go back to church and be as pure as the driven snow. And then he would uh, go, I mean, it was, it was basically this throughout 30 years and um and one day and i had lost track of him and you know how some people just have such an impact in your heart and mind that i always wondered what happened to doug and i always wanted to find him again and talk to him while i was sitting in church and somebody mentioned that there was doug over in hospice two blocks away and it was the doug and i went over to see him and he was dying of als and he could bear, you know, his body was emaciated. He could barely talk. Um, I was so glad to see him. And he knew he didn't have much time left. This was probably about 2014, I think. Or no, it might have been 2015. I told him what I was up to and I would do his portrait and tears started rolling down his eyes. And then I, we had the discussion, are you still gay? And he says, no, I'm not. I've been healed. I've been healed from being gay for the past five years. And I thought, I know that's not true. You know, I know all of a sudden everything about his life had been the fight and the reaction and the survival to find a way to be at peace with these two things that were never going to have resolution in his heart. 
I believed he truly was gay. And I believed he truly loved the gospel. And those things would, would never find resolution here on earth. So I'm, I'm telling you, I certainly didn't argue with him. And I also believed that he thought he wasn't gay now because he knew he was going to die and he was terrified. You know, I'm going to meet my maker and I'm going to have the right story to tell, you know, once again. But when we think of what our lives mean to other people, we sometimes don't realize that it's something really, really small or seeming insignificant that can be their greatest gift. And all of a sudden then I just thought of the 30 years I'd known him and the journey and the pull both ways. And that, that grabbed my heart with compassion in a way that I'd never really seen before. And I thought that's his gift. His gift is to show me what people go through, you know, and that, it, and it's still to this day, I can't say there's an easy out for any of this, but he was the first person I wanted to do. And he was the first person I did. And as you signed your name at the bottom of that portrait and completed the Doug portrait, what motivated you to move to number two? Yeah, and I do want to say that speaking at Doug's funeral a couple weeks later, you know, the family did not want to know about Doug being gay. So that's another thing. I just wanted to put that out there. And his service was at a Mormon church. <laughs> so, okay, who, who was next? Well, again, it's different from the group that I was presented with, but this came later, Bob. And I've done a portrait of him that hasn't seen a lot of the light of day on, on, um, on Facebook. But he was one of the men in that group that had AIDS who lived another 20 years and just recently died. Um, and I don't remember the, how, why he died, but we, he did death with dignity, so we were all there. And I did a portrait of him with his skin in rainbow color. But the message there was... Bob had no idea of how his life would affect me or how it would affect thousands of other people who saw the portraits. Um, Bob was just being Bob. And again, that was, he had changed a lot of lives for the better. He was a sponsor in AA. But he, he was another reason because of the, that meeting way back when that, okay, so you're asking me, and who did I do next? Um, it's hard for me to remember exactly who I did next. I can tell you some of the people I did, and if you ask me about them, I can tell you what was what was motivating. I'm just here just eating up the stories. I yeah, love it. I, I, mean, would... I, just, I love the background as, as we're seeing these photos uh, of these portraits. Uh, I just love the background behind them because we don't get the backstory. We, we can just see what you were able to capture um, through your talent, but I, I love the backstory behind them. And I was, uh, Bob was still alive like in 2017, maybe even 18, I think it was 18. And I had started this project and I uh, knew that he was gearing up to do Death with Dignity. And I said, Bob, I want you to know I have raised $29,000 to do 30 portraits of gay Mormons, and that when people see these portraits, it is causing a ripple effect of healing, and it's causing an effect of people's hearts being touched, and it's giving courage to people who have to, that do walk this journey. Um, and I said, I just want you to know that you inviting me into the group, because he was kind of like the leader of the pack, because of that, thousands of people. And then I'll, I was interviewed on King 5 Evening News, too, which has a, a reach of about 32 million people. So um, I said, Bob, that's the ripple effect of your legacy. So as you, as you began this project, mm -hmm. you really crowdsourced this. You needed yeah. the help of the yes. community yeah. to not only fund, but help distribute and, and provide venue for these, these yes. stories to be told. Yeah. And so how, how did you do that? What, or what, how, what were the ideas 
churning well, in your mind to yeah. get to that point? Well, it, first of all, it was slightly awful. I'm just going to tell you that because I've had to ha find my own healing along the way. And actually, I'm so grateful to talk to you today because I've really come overcome a lot of what was in my way. Um, when I first got some serious support for this project, I also got a lot of gossip and criticism from females that are in the LGBT community and and what was um, one of the things I really felt ashamed about was that I've always been good at raising money. And I felt thought that the criticism was, well, she's greedy. That's all she's up to. She doesn't care about you. Um, I felt the shame of being a woman who's aggressive and who knows how to make things happen. And then I could tell myself things like, well, um, you know, I live in Seattle where I, my adult life, I've known that it's up to me to take care of myself. I don't, I'm not married. No one's going to do it for me. So it, so being aggressive or, or being powerful in the world is a really important part of who I am. The other thing was that this project gave me life as my art gave me life. As I um, resigned from being a truck driver back in 89 and declared I'm going to become an artist, and I did, and I've been a professional artist. As I learned about art, that also healed my soul. And I wanna tell people out there, one of the really great spiritual experiences that you can have is unleashing your creative self-expression. That can be tremendously high in healing. I, I love building something in the world, you know? and. Um, and I feel that my own life is awakened to the point where I'm doing that with less and less apology. And that's what, one of the reasons I'm so grateful to talk with you today is because I am bound and determined to not let smallness stop me from healing people that can be healed or having the rewarding experience of being part of that. I think that's so beautiful. And, and that's what what we all want for the marginalized communities. We want there to be no marginalized communities. Yeah, really. We want there just to be community. Yeah. So as you raise the funds um, mm -hmm. in order to make this project, to give this project legs and, and allow it to run, mm. where do you display the art? And, and how, do you, how do you share those stories? Okay, so um, I also was involved in Landmark, and I don't know if you've heard of that, but they have a program called... Um, leadership uh well it's a leadership program that's two years long and in that you create a, a a game in the world and my game in the world was healing through these portraits and then i created a team and i learned how to organize other people and include them in the effort because really you can't there's not all that much you can do all by yourself. Um, and one of the great things that happened was I did art nights for 18 weeks and people would come and we would do art together and some of them would help me with the portraits. That was the other thing, learning how to turn this project over to other people so that they could grow. Um, th that was again, hard for me because I want to be in the shell. I want to, you know, like, <laughs> But I was great at it with the support that I had. I was absolutely great at it. So I was including people. Um, I um, moved to a play, an artist loft space with other artists. And I had these art nights every Monday night. I had people help with the portraits. I started um, putting the word out there. I was first invited to the affirmation that happened in Provo. I think that might've been 2016, I'm not sure. Um, and then the next place I showed was where I lived, which was an art center. And then the next place I showed was at Central, Seattle Central College. Had a beautiful show there for about a month. And then I got it at Berkeley. Um, I don't remember if Berkeley came after Salt Lake City. I'm just gonna say it came before. It was really hard to get into the Bay Area. Um, there were some things that were gonna be really great and they fell through, but eventually See, this is what happens when we tell our story. You never know who's listening. And I just remember in my 12-step meeting, I was like, well, I'm doing this project. And this guy came up to me afterwards. His name was Jared Chase. And he said, you know, 
I went to school at the Pacific School of Religion at Berkeley, and he said, I love what you're doing. Here's a name and a phone number. So I called there, and at first they were like, well, we don't have any place for you. But then I sent them a little video, and then they're like, well, I think we can find a place for you. And what they did is they found half of a museum, the Badet Museum in Berkeley, and they gave me a show for three months. That was, like, incredible. Um, and then after, I think the Salt Palace was the last place that I showed, and that was with affirmation. And that was a better experience for sure. Um, but at this certain point when I had the list and I had the stories, and I also had some, um, I think, guidance from Mitch Main, who I think is absolutely brilliant, also Richard Osler. Um, Mitch really wanted to encourage me to leave all the all the ugly cooties out of my stories, <laughs> you know, and making it all about me. <laughs> and, you know, he, he really, wow, what a brilliant guy. But again, letting go of it so that it could be, so that I could turn it over to the community and it could be about them. Um, so that, that was helping me shape the message as the paintings were being painted. And I think the first, my first interaction with your paintings uh, was at the Salt Palace, that that yeah. um, affirmation conference at the Salt Palace. I just remember walking into the room and they the room was just lined with your with your paintings. And and there were stories that of people, there were faces that I had not yet met before. There were I remember Nathan and Melissa and Nick and Spencer and uh, Hunter and so many of these people that I had never interacted with before. And it was intriguing because, as you mentioned, um, with Bob, uh, Bob was painted in rainbow. And all of these uh, portraits were done in unique colors and different styles. I just, I just, why? Why that? Why, what? invited that? What, what was the idea behind that? Well, I think it's really, when I do my best work, I'm channeling God. So I can pick up very quickly um, what the truth is for somebody. Although I've learned to not go around telling people what their truth is. <laughs> but I will get impressions. I mean, it's almost like being psychic in a way, but I will get impressions about colors and shapes and situations that fit with the person. And so really what I want to reflect is their innate beauty and dignity, but in that too is their uniqueness. It's their individuality. So a lot of times I just feel prompted to harmonize it with what I know about the person. As an active Latter-day Saint, um, how does your art square with your faith today? The, the church has made a complete 180 in terms of where they were at with the November 2015 policy. Yes. They, on its face, they dismantled it and, and got rid of it. Um, I would argue some, el some of those elements still apply within Mormonism, unfortunately. But the, the church is trying to do better. Um, I will say the grassroots part of Mormonism is much better. The closer you are to the LGBTQ person, the better this topic looks and, and becomes because we know and see and interact daily with those queer people. And when Latter-day Saints have a direct relationship with a queer person, something inside of them changes. But unfortunately, we're not seeing that change at the highest levels of Mormonism. Right. And I think it's because of proximity. The leaders of the church are not close to, to gay people. And they're to, insulated. To transgender people. They're insulated. Insulated is a great word. And when you yeah. insulate yourself from someone else, you're not able to feel their warmth. And, and I think that's one grand problem in Mormonism. So there has obviously been some change that's happened um, since November of 2015, since you started the uh, Portraits of Courage project. Are you still seeing pushback within your faith, within your, your religion? Is Mormonism accepting of this type of advocacy? Well, you know, it. yes, I think mostly yes, but let's put this in context. Um, that's why I've had a hard time here on, in our interview saying I've gone back to church and I am embrace and I'm actually really grateful because I feel like I have finally come to peace at what Mormonism means to me. 
But I'm also in an air, a city that's very liberal, and it's a city that accepted a, has accepted a lot of gay people at church. And it's also an area where a lot of people left the church because they, they couldn't support the way gay people were being treated. Um, I can proudly tell you that I have borne my testimony many times, and I've been extremely candid about what this project has meant to me and what I intend, what, what the reason is and how important it is that we follow Christ's admonition to love even those we may not understand. And almost miraculously, it's been well received. Um, but I really, I consider the source too of where I'm at. So the, like, like being able to go to church and feel at peace about it and feel loved and accepted is like the dream come true. It's the fantasy world that almost nobody experiences really, I think. Um, but there are many, many people in temple recommend holding uh, Mormons in my area who are very much in favor of this project. And I, I believe they would be totally fine with having me at, ha, do it at the cultural center. In fact, that may be the next place to go. I know a lot of people have stepped forward in being very, um, uh, very much advocates. Just a question about your local congregation. Yeah. And you really don't need to throw anybody under the bus, but I'm just curious, um, are there, LGBTQ people that attend your ward or your stake? Yeah, there were a lot more of them though. Um, I will say that one of the people in the in the stake presidency, there was a time when they were going out of their way to invite gay people to church and, and a large number of people were coming out to church that were gay. And when that policy leaked, it, it, it it fell hard. It really fell hard. But yes, there there's a couple in the ward next to me that are um, men who are married and they've adopted a baby and they're part of a family that's been um, very, very involved in the community for decades. So there is a lot of that too, but I, I don't see as many people there um, as before the policy. I'm just, uh, and I'm putting you right on the spot, but do you, do you opine why? Do you know, do you think, do you know why you're not seeing mm -hmm. queer people in congregations, Mormon congregations like you did before? Yeah. Um, because people were really hurt as I was really shocked by the way that policy came across. I don't think, um, from what I can see and the many, many people I've talked with, I think most of the people I attend church with would open welcome gay people with open arms and do, and do. Um, but you know, there's that leadership in Salt Lake. So and I don't know. I mean, it's almost like the, the church in Seattle is really different from the church that's here. I hear that a lot. And I, I don't mm -hmm. disagree with it. The culture is completely different. Growing up inside of Mormonism at Mormon Mecca here in Utah, mm -hmm. um, can mess with your mind. Yeah, and a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people outside of Utah, look at this place as everywhere else outside of Utah as the mission field. Yeah, we grew up with that saying, like in the mission field, and we even say that with this general conference voice. Um, yeah, yeah. The but but really outside of Utah, the church is different, and and I wonder if it is has something to do with the. The, again, the proximity that the Latter-day Saints have to real, live queer people when they, when they are smaller yeah. in congregations or branches and they're able to have a genuine relationship with these people who, I mean, let's be frank, in some of these areas outside of Utah where you are meeting in cottages and in schools where these branches are just barely holding on by their fingernails, they literally will take anybody just to show up to church. Yeah. And, and they, and I, I think that might be part of the difference. The, the member, the general membership is so broad in Utah that they cast aside anybody who doesn't look like them or act like them or believe like them. And, and we lose the ability to harness the individual and, and that individual's purpose and talents. And we and, cast them away for who and what they are. And we lose the joy 
that happens when you're in a real life situation, just like in the meeting in the 1990s. Um, yeah. It's, I think it's a there's great point. Yeah. A, I mean, I remember going to church here when in the 70s when I went to Cottonwood and then BYU, and just there was such a sterile feeling in the. And this is totally my judgment, but there was a feeling of. Um, the Stepford wives and the Stepford husbands and the Stepford children. I mean, it was just people were walking through the motions and it it didn't feel um, nourishing to my soul to be around that. In fact, I found it really, really sad. But let's talk about tithing for a minute too, because this is really a motivator. Um, Bernie Schlager, who's like the dean of the Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, um, a theolo theologist um, has said, well, you know, in the beginning, the Catholic Church, it was illegal to have usurary money or do loans with interest. But at a certain point, the Catholic Church just threw that out because financially it was much more advantageous for them to start doing loans with interest. And I think watching a lot of really wealthy and powerful people leave the church I mean, that, there are people who think that the bottom line is the thing that will eventually make the difference. You know, up here, we don't care, we don't have to, you know? But I mean, I've just seen, it, it's actually heartbreaking to me too because I've seen a lot of really powerful, amazing people leave um, over this issue that are not gay, but I, I hate to see the fire go, you know? I hate to see the fire dim. We'll put it that way for whatever reason. Yeah, I think that's a great point too, because I've noticed that as well. Not only just, um, I would air quote, like rich and famous, um, mm -hmm. these uh, celebrities who are leaving, but we're seeing like just recently, Jeff Green, billionaire Jeff Green, who was a Latter-day Saint, some in the Huntsman family. I mean, we're seeing prominent Mormon families that are packing their bags and, and taking with them what was important and beautiful as part of their framework, the the roots of Mormonism that still exists, but then they're finding happiness somewhere else and, and using their time and talents in other places. I hope that they are. I mean, I think they're, for me, I know that there is a certain resolution that's happened as I've come back and surrendered. Um, but I also was hard changed by through the 12 step program. So I'm not, I'm not, looking at the leaders and saying, you made me do anything because I found my own way through artwork and through 12 steps and all of this other. Um, there, there is something about Mormonism that is hard to duplicate outside or the dream of it. We'll say maybe not the reality of every day, every week situations, but the dream of what we all bought into is hard to duplicate. I think that's a really fair point. And I think a lot of people hold on to Mormonism with the very tips of their fingernails for this idea of uh, celestial eternity. Yeah. This idea of having all of this be worth it in the end. That indeed there is um, life after this world. And that life includes being united as an eternal family. And in the meantime, they're not breathing. So I can tell you because I tried every kind of sin in every kind of way over the years and I'm 61 now and I know for myself that my way didn't work, <laughs> but I am at peace with it. I, but this whole waiting until the next life, um, as long as you're not breathing, which a lot of, you know, white knuckling people are not breathing, my heart aches for that because that's not really... That's not a fullness of joy. That indeed is not living to the fullest measure of your creation. Right. I think that, that's important. So the whole situation is bedeviling. <laughs> so this uh, portrait, Portraits of Courage yes. project, um, how does the audience help you? I, I am such a fan and such a believer in the real lived experiences and sharing of stories, uh, particular to the queer community. How, to, how do we support and help you continue painting those stories? I think what I need to do is um, start a new fundraiser, number one, because the last time I took a donation for this project was 
maybe three years ago. And so I do think as I've been sharing, during June, I decided it was Pride Month, and so I started sharing a bunch of stuff. And there are people I promised to paint that have never, they are still waiting. And I do think people were interested, but when they see a campaign that like went cold three years ago, they're wondering, well, like what's up with this? But I think maybe I just need to, um, well, first of all, I would invite anybody who's interested in the healing that can come from this portrait work to please contact me and let's just work it out one way or another. And I, this may be the, the really wonderful thing that com, may come from this, which I think is coming from this today, is my willingness to jump off the high dive and go at it now with even more renewed strength and passion. You said um, you would advise people to contact you. How do they get a hold of you? Um, on Facebook, uh, you can send me a message. I also have, um, well, I have a website. That's fine if they want to contact me through that. I have several websites, but I think um, my phone number, which I'm glad to give out, or email, um, whatever you think would be, I am open to people reaching out about this. So Melinda Hanna on Facebook, mm -hmm. super easy to yeah. find you yes, and send you a Facebook message and yes. then they can run from there. And I'm also on Instagram, not quite as much, but yeah. All right. I at least wanted to throw no, that portion you. in there yeah. because I, uh, I'm just such a fan of this project. I, I need to make sure I surround myself with people. And I'll also, like I said, since I have been, was busy moving the last four years or a lot of the last four years, um, my heart has hungered to be making the kind of difference that this can make, you know, and there's a lot of artists out there and some are better and some are worse, but this is a really unique message. I can see your innate beauty and dignity and I wanna show you yourself the way I think God sees you, you know, and what a thing to, people tell me this, they hang a painting up that I did and they walk past it and, and it uplifts their heart every single time, you know, it's that touchstone. What, as we wrap the podcast, yeah. <laughs> what haven't we talked about that you wanted to talk about? I get, I just want to tie it in a little bow with I know so many long-suffering Mormons who give it everything they have with all the knowledge they have, and they are heavily criticized in places like Seattle. And I do not, I want people to know that there are people out there trying to live the Mormon faith that are some of truly wonderful people. And I do not want them to suffer because I also think there's a benefit in life to talking about the way things are, that the, the fastest way to get through the wall in front of me is to acknowledge what it is. And I found that in 12 steps. You don't progress until you start telling the truth. And so we have shared some things today in this meeting that are very powerful and, and cr critical. And and I think it's important. I think it's part of the path of more healing coming because there are people who are listening to us that that's like, wow, I didn't know anyone knew that or thought that um, that's happening. But I also, my heart goes out to every well-meaning Christian who is really giving it their all and, and doesn't need one more uh, ounce of criticism in their direction. Does that make any sense? It makes a lot of sense. Okay. As you were as you were talking about that, I just had kind of this vision of a room with all of your art, um, these portraits of courage, of LGBTQ stories and faces lining the walls. If you were to walk arm in arm with President Nelson, with the Pope, with religious leaders, as you took them on a tour of this room with all of those individual stories, what would you want them to know? Well, as you were talking, the first thing comes to mind, I can imagine walking with the Pope arm in arm. Now, see, I don't know him though, but I could imagine him hearing the stories. Now, I don't know about President Nelson because I know that the background of some of the men in leadership is, is um, 
not isolated, but it's sequestered. So I don't, I, it could be an incredibly wonderful thing if they came with me with open heart and open mind and open ears. It could be just the most glorious thing and we could feel Christ there together. I will tell you that the bishop of my ward in Seattle would do that. He would certainly with full heart and, and embrace the love that is available in this project. And a lot of the people I go to church with too. I think it's beautiful. And I think that's a call to Mormonism to yeah, yeah. follow the admonition of exactly what President Ballard was saying, doing better at this, listening to and understanding the experiences of the LGBTQ community. That is one of the steps that, can, that you can take as Latter-day Saints. And another step is that um, we do have to face how things land. Like I know a lot of my family is extremely Mormon and didn't want me to say anything that could be perceived as criticism. Um, but we cannot deny how what we do lands for other people. And if we can do something to help heal their pain, wouldn't we want to? I love that. Amen to that. Yeah. Uh, the great Maya Angelou quote, when we know better, we do better. And we all need to do a little bit better. Yeah, for sure. On both sides of this aisle. Absolutely. Melinda, thank you. <laughs> Can you believe it was, it's an hour already? No, I can't. I mean, it was such, you know, I was unleashed. <laughs> and I loved it. <laughs> thank you for giving us um, an hour of your time and, and giving a, just a glimpse into uh, your story and your experience and what you've been able to do in this space. I want you to know that it changed me as a young baby gay who had just come out of the closet, who uh, recently had divorced his wife and wow. unrooted our family with four kids in a very yes. perfect Mormon world, the white picket fence Mormon life. Yeah. One of my very first interactions was walking into that room and seeing all of those portraits and, and recognizing wow. the enormity of those stories and the importance that the message that it taught me um, was a message that I often relay on this podcast. You are not alone. You are not broken and that there is a whole community of people out here who support you and share your story. And I saw that in a room full of portraits. And your greatest joy in life is still ahead. Your best days are still ahead. Yes, yes, and yes. Because I, as I saw those portraits and got to know the people behind those paintings, I saw that there again was happiness and that there was there were spiritual experiences. There were joy. Uh, there was joy. There were all those, all those things that I had been conditioned and indoctrinated to believe no longer existed because I, I had not stepped away from the church, but the church stepped away from me. Yeah. And you and, and Christ is with you now and even more so as you continue your journey forward. I think that's a great way to end. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Again, thank you so much. And thank you for uh, spending your hour uh, on another incredible Latter Gay Stories podcast episode. If you are watching on a video version, we invite you to uh, share your comments below. And just a personal um, plea to support Melinda and her project uh, to help continue sharing these stories. And, and if you so desire, give of your time, talent, and resources to help her um, see that more of these paintings happen. Um, as I said, it, it changed me and I hope that it changes you as well. And I hope that by supporting this project and others like it, we can continue to help share the stories and experiences of the LGBTQ community. And for those of you who are listening to the audio version who didn't get to see some of the paintings, we invite you to jump over to YouTube or Facebook or to our website and catch the video version of this uh, audio podcast so that you can see the uh, the profound simplicity of this art and and the moving parts of, of what Melinda is able to do. So again, thank you. Um, we invite you to also subscribe uh, to this channel wherever you are listening to your audio, favorite audio podcasts. We are there through Google, Apple, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, and others. 
And again, if you are watching on a video version, we invite you to subscribe to this channel so that you can be informed every time we post a new episode. Thank you again for supporting the Latter Day Stories podcast. Uh, and again, if you are wanting, I'll just throw this in last before we, we leave, but if you are wanting to get a hold of Melinda Hanna, um, you can find her on Facebook, on Instagram, uh, simple type of the name and send her a message. And uh, if nothing else, just let her know uh, your thoughts and feelings about the art. I think artists enjoy that aspect as well. Some genuine feedback about um, some of this work. So again, thank you. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time. Thank you for uh, benefiting um, from this story. But most importantly, thank you for sharing your own individual story. It's stories like yours. It's stories like Melinda's and others that help us each, write, each to continue writing our own latter gay story.